This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. I welcome Mark Clifford, the author of Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. Mark is a veteran journalist, many, many years in Hong Kong, uh, various publications, the South China Morning Post, and then as a director not, uh, of the Apple Daily publication. We are now looking at how did we get to a city that is ha that's had its spirit crushed by the People's Republic of China's bully boys? And we begin with a quote that Mark gives in his chapter about how we got here. This is from the distinguished scholar, Perry Ling. The Chinese government's censorial authority in recent times has resembled not so much a man-eating tiger or fire-snorting dragon as a giant anaconda coiled in an overhead chandelier. Mark, congratulations and good evening to you. I ask you to explain that, that anaconda in the chandelier above us. How does that sit on the people of Hong Kong then and now? Good evening to you. Well, good evening, John, and thanks, of course, uh, for your interest. Um, well, Perry Link was talking about the trying to explain the puzzle of how visitors to China would see well-stocked supermarkets, um, luxury department stores, and contrasting that with the old Soviet Union, where there was never anything and people looked really beaten down. And in China, people, to outward appearances, look like they're having kind of, you know, middle class lives, especially in the city with without a lot of oppression. But the Chinese, uh, he compared it to the anaconda. The, the rest of the quote goes on to talk about um, guests at a cocktail party. It's an elegant party. Everyone's well-dressed. They're enjoying their champagne. But they all know that anaconda is up there in the chandelier. And the anaconda doesn't really need to do a lot. But every once in a while, it reaches out and more or less at random just grabs someone and kills them. And uh, I think that's a, that's a really great analogy for, for China and also for Hong Kong. Most of the time, um, by all appearances, for particularly Western visitors who don't know China well, can go and and think it could look like you know many other Asian cities. And uh, what's the problem? What's the difference between Japan and China, for example? But I think Perry's point is that this is a very very dangerous anaconda that's up there in the chandelier. It will and it does destroy people and, and destroy cities, as it's done with Hong Kong. It is 2014. Who is Benny Tai, and what is Occupy Central? Mall? Benny Tai uh, is a, a mild-mannered, uh, was a professor until he lost his job at the University of Hong Kong. He was a law professor, and he was committed to using legal processes to try to get political change in, in Hong Kong. And we, we need to remember that when China took over from Britain, took over the colony of Hong Kong in 1997, it made many promises to the people of Hong Kong, who were understandably skittish about being taken over by a communist regime that... Uh, seven years, eight years earlier in 1989, had slaughtered hundreds of students and pro-democracy protesters in and around Tiananmen Square in Beijing. So uh, Beijing, China wanted to keep Hong Kong happy. It made uh, promises that the existing way of life, the freedoms that Hong Kong people enjoyed, would uh, remain unchanged for 50 years. And not only would they be would um, freedoms exist, but it would be even better, even more democratic. You know, Hong Kong people would be rulers in their own house. The nasty British colonial oppressors would be gone. Hong Kong people would have the right to universal suffrage. They could elect their own city council, their own mayor. I mean, this was great stuff. Unfortunately, uh, the anaconda in the chandelier had absolutely no intention of carrying through on those promises. I think the Chinese may have deluded themselves into thinking that uh, the Hong Kong people would uh, like the idea of being ruled by China so much that they'd go along with the Chinese Communist Party. Not the case. Hong Kong people consistently have voted for pro-democracy candidates. And by 2014, so getting on to two decades after China took over Hong Kong from colonial Britain, uh, uh, the people of Hong Kong were really getting fed up. And Benny Tai uh, came up with an idea that w th a massive campaign of civil disobedience would help push China to keep its promises, again, to keep the promises it made that the Hong Kong people could elect their own mayor and their own city council and enjoy the, the freedoms they always had. And uh, that led to you know an unbelievable um, popular uh, 
uh, demonstration where the streets of downtown Hong Kong were occupied for 79 days by protesters. 79 days leading to violence, tear gas in September of 2014. Did that surprise you and your colleagues, Mark? Well, I think it surprised everybody, including Benny Tai, because as I said, Benny Tai was a mild-mannered uh, law professor who was great at writing uh, newspaper articles and thinking of uh, kind of, um, you know, I guess innovative strat strategies of civil disobedience. But I don't think Benny Tai ever thought this was really going to go anywhere. And he was, he was very polite and the, it was going to be an Occupy movement that wasn't going to inconvenience anyone. So it was going to be more symbolic than anything else. But times had changed and a new generation of Hong Kongers who were born around the time of the, of the 1997 handovers took to the streets. So Benny had basically given up and, and uh, more or less surrendered, but the students coming back uh, to campus in the autumn of uh, 2014 uh, started a, a student strike. Again, it didn't seem like it was amounting to much. And then at the end of September, had a demonstration outside the, the city council, the government buildings, and ended up uh, led by a 15-year-old uh, high school student, uh, Joshua Wong, uh, stormed, stormed the gates, actually went over the fence, a handful of them, I think fewer than a dozen, uh, occupied a small area ironically called Civic Square, which was supposed to be a place for, like Hyde Park where people could exercise free speech. One thing led to another. Tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people rallied in support of the imprisoned Joshua Wong and... Um, uh, the, the, the event snowballed, the police panicked and uh, fired off 87 rounds of tear gas. Uh, compared to what came later, this was nothing, but it was the first time that tear gas had been used against Hong Kong people since the, the handover to, to China. Uh, so this in turn just inflamed people and led, led to this extraordinary takeover that was, I would say, the, the biggest frontal challenge to the Chinese Communist Party since 1949, with the exception of those 1989 pro-democracy protests. This was a big deal. This was the, an international financial capital uh, that was, you know, had major sections of it. It wasn't just downtown uh, Hong Kong. There were a couple other areas in the city, Mongkok, Causeway Bay, they were also occupied. And there, there were tent cities. Everybody was well behaved. They were singing. They were having teach-ins. Kids were doing their homework. Yellow, uh, um, yellow umbrellas. Well, the umbrella. That's where the umbrella movement came. I, I notion um, came from. There was that first night, that Sunday night at the end of September, when the eighty-seven rounds of tear gas were fired. There was a. It, people were shocked. I mean, they weren't prepared for to be attacked by their own policemen when they were uh, peacefully protesting and. Uh, the, but one one protester was was photographed holding up an umbrella, vainly trying to protect himself against tear gas with an umbrella. Doesn't work, but um, uh, that was the photo. That was the iconic photo that became um, so it became known as the umbrella uprising, umbrella um, uh, the Occupy Central. Si Walong is the mayor or the leader of or the administrator of Hong Kong at the time, but he works for Beijing. And you take us to a luncheon in January of 2015. Jimmy Lai, who was Jimmy Lai? And how is it that he regretted the protests hadn't been larger? What was his thinking at the time? Jimmy Lai was uh, an extraordinary entrepreneur who, like many Hong Kongers, was born in China. Uh, the family was ripped apart by the, the Maoist revolution, the communist revolution of 1949. Jimmy had been born a couple of years earlier in 1947. At the age of 12, so 1959, 1960, he uh, smuggled himself in on a small fishing boat into Hong Kong, started working in a garment factory, taught himself English by reading a dictionary, and like thousands of other Hong Kongers, made it good. Uh, I mean, really made it good. Became a, a businessman, had first had a textile factory, was making sweaters. Uh, a, a partnership, in fact, with the mainland Chinese organization, which, given his his later opposition to the to the regime, I think shows the fact that this guy is not anti-Chinese. He's very pro-Chinese, but he's anti-communist. And he then started a um, a clothing chain, uh, the Giordano Retail Stores, very successful. But after the killings in 1989 in Tiananmen. Uh, he got so mad that he started a magazine to oppose the Chinese communist regime. 
uh, that um, was so successful he started a newspaper and he became uh, one of the most important, if not the most important media magnates in the Chinese uh, speaking world. I mean, anywhere in East Asia. Apple Daily. Apple Daily. Well, first it was Next Magazine and the company was Next Digital. Then it was Apple Daily. And uh, uh, it had nothing to do with Apple Computer. Apple Computer was a small, struggling computer company trying to fight off fight for survival in the 1990s when Jimmy started. But Jimmy uh, converted to Catholicism in the 1990s. And he said, uh, he looked at the biblical apple and he said, Eve ate the apple and then there was news. And without that apple, there wouldn't have been any news. So uh, his idea was to bring people the news of democracy. And uh, he knew that other media people were pulling back because they were afraid of the Chinese. Uh, and he Put, you know, went ahead full steam. And so he regretted that the protests weren't larger. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, he well, he regretted that they failed. So 2015, I mean, he was somebody that I met in the early 1990s when I moved to Hong Kong. And uh, I saw him from time to time. And uh, we were having a, a lunch uh, just after the failure of Occupy Central. I say it's a failure. I, I thought it was a success. And that's what I said. Uh, um, but after 79 days, the demonstrators packed up and went home, and they, they went home empty-handed. Uh, the chief executive you alluded to, C.Y. Lung, the, the mayor of Hong Kong, uh, refused to negotiate, refused to give Hong Kong people the promises that Beijing had made in terms of universal suffrage. And um, I think the, the movement was at a bit of a standstill. Here they, they'd occupied the city for 79 days. You know, unbelievable hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets and they came away empty handed. And Jimmy was so discouraged. Um, he is has always been a man of of nonviolence, very, very principled uh, stance on nonviolence. But uh, um, yeah, this was nonviolent. It was huge. It was like really almost nothing the world's ever soon, seen. And it didn't get any result. I felt that it was successful because it spoke truth to power. It showed what Hong Kong people thought. And um, but Jimmy felt it was a failure. R. Clifford, the author of Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World. When we come back, the backstory of Hong Kong today. Hong Kong is part of the story of Europe discovering Asia. 16th century Portuguese, 18th century the United Kingdom. Empires come and go, they're colonial masters. We race to the crisis of the uh, not 18th, uh, 19th century, which is the Opium Wars. And then we race again to the Japanese invasion of the mainland and the occupation of Hong Kong, 41 to 45. Hong Kong was attacked on the same day Pearl Harbor was attacked. This moment, however, strikes me as revelatory in Mark's books. And it's a story of how the people of Hong Kong were treated by London, the, benign, the, uh, the beloved democracy, a parliamentary democracy of London. What I read, Mark, is that in 1945, August of 45, the British reoccupy uh, re Hong Kong. They're the administrators. And there's a governor and there's the British Empire. Uh, Churchill is moving on. And there's a new foreign minister. Uh, that's His name is Bevan. That's a moment you note that Hong Kong was ready for self-governance. And there was something called the blimps that disregarded it. Who were the blimps? Well, uh, yeah, great questions, a great moment that was not seized. Uh, Hong Kong was a very insular, self-satisfied, snobbish uh, colony. And the, the blimps were uh, the, the British businessmen and administrators uh, who, who personified that. I mean, it was anti-Semitic, uh, not surprisingly, it was racist towards Chinese and basically everybody. Uh, and uh, these were people who got away with things, whether it was um, political arrangements or, or you know, economic uh, uh, deals that, you know, wouldn't have existed in Britain in the 20th century. I mean, they were still talking as if, you know, this were early 19th century Britain. But there was a visionary governor, Mark Young, who had been governor at the time of the Japanese invasion after surviving horrible privations, uh, eventually ended up as a Mongol in Mongolia as a 
cattle herder, I think a goat herder, uh, Mark Young came back and everybody realized that the, wor the world had changed dramatically and the British myth of uh, invincibility and superiority and you know, knowing everything was smashed and it was time for the people of Hong Kong to have more of a say. I mean, here was a, a wealthy, thriving port, got back on its feet faster than just about anywhere in Asia. And Mark Young proposed a, a very modest move towards democracy, not self-government, but for Hong Kong people to start being able to elect some of their own representatives. And it was smacked down uh, above all by the business community. And it's not only the blimps in the uh, British business community, but their counterparts among the, the Chinese merchant elite. And the Chinese didn't want, uh, the Chinese elite didn't want coolies and rickshaw drivers and dock workers voting any more than the British did. And unfortunately, Mark Young, I, I think he was so worn out by the war and his, his, um, his captivity uh, was recalled a couple of years later and a much more conservative governor was brought in, Alexander Grantham, served for 10 years. I, he did a great job on the economy. Unfortunately, he had no regard for uh, any kind of political development in Hong Kong, quite the opposite. And uh, it was a moment lost. And by the way, uh, after the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949, the Chinese uh, leadership at the very top worried about exactly what you were talking about, a move toward a self-government. And right. they saw a plot actually led by the Americans that would lead to a kind of dominion status that would take Hong Kong down a, a road that Singapore eventually followed, which was independence. They really didn't want that. So the, the poor people of Hong Kong had everybody against them, right? They didn't have the Americans. They, the FDR had tried to move uh, Hong Kong towards um, some kind of independent tried to take it away from being a British colony. But of course, he passed away a few months before the end of the war. Um, and so you had the Chinese business elite, you had the Chinese communist regime, you had the British business elite, and now you had the British colonial government, all of them opposed to more democracy for the Hong Kong people. It was a, it was a lost moment. And it's one that we're still living with the consequences of today, 70, 75 years later. We have a couple of minutes and to make the point as you do very carefully that Hong Kong has a distinct culture from the mainland, though it's been not very far, you can see it. However, that distinct culture begins with the language. In Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese. On the mainland, they speak Mandarin. I did not realize that the Hong Kongers can routinely understand Mandarin, but not vice versa. And I can imagine that was even more profound in 1945. These were two worlds. These were and are two worlds, and if, if anything, they're getting more distinct, and the mainland would like them to merge, but the Hong Kong people have uh, continued to carve out a very strong identity. In fact, Apple Daily was the first uh, major media to start writing uh, using Chinese uh, character, or using Cantonese, spoken Cantonese. It would often make up ca new characters and words to be able to write down what was effectively a spoken language. So, you know, it's like Spanish and Portuguese. Actually, it's more different. Uh, the Chinese rulers try to say that Cantonese is just a dialect, but a dialect just means you don't have an army. Uh, if you have an army, you're a language. If you don't, you're a dialect. And unfortunately for Hong Kong, although it's carved out a lot of cultural and linguistic uh, autonomy, it doesn't have an army. Today, Hong Kong, tomorrow the world, what China's crackdown reveals about its plans to end freedom everywhere. Mark arrives in Hong Kong in 1992. At that point, everybody in China, I read, was still reacting to, thinking about, or unaware of something that horrible had happened in Beijing in 1989 that we now refer to as Tiananmen. What was Tiananmen to the people of Hong Kong when you arrived, Mark? Can you cast your youth and imagine what they were saying about it, what they thought about it every June when the anniversary came? Well, they didn't wait until every June, pretty much every day they were conscious that in five years, they were gonna be taken over by the Chinese Communist Party. And the slogan was, today's China is tomorrow's Hong Kong. That's what started, uh, that was appeared um, during the pro-democracy protests of 1989, not just in Beijing, but in dozens and scores of cities around China. And you know, hundreds of people were killed outside of, of Beijing. And so Hong Kong was very aware that uh, the brutality that they saw in China, displayed by the leadership to kill the best, some of the best and the brightest of the students in Beijing and others around the country, that brutality, that leadership was going to be taking over Hong Kong in five years. So there was a lot of fear. And I moved uh, in June, mid-1992, June, 
And it was a couple months after the supreme leader, Deng Xiaoping, uh, had made a famous southern tour, which was trying to revive. He went to the south of China from Beijing. He was in his 90s then. And it wasn't his late, late 80s then. Um, and uh, he was trying to revitalize economic reforms because Deng had started economic reforms after the disastrous Mao years. And they had gotten some purchase, gotten going, but it was still early days. And then the Tiananmen killings just stopped everything. And Deng was trying to restart the economy and restart the economy, but keep politics under control. And so Hong Kong was very aware of that. Here was the most open economy in what was going to be, you know, it's going to be part of China, and yet a place that was also the most open politically. So everybody, every day, worried about 1997. In 1982, Margaret Thatcher, then the Prime Minister of Britain, visited Hong Kong, and that was the moment when Britain decided or was obliged to decide that Hong Kong in 15 years time would be passed over to the mainland's governance. Everybody's aware in 1982, that was the depths of the Cold War. That's when it was routine to imagine that the world is going to end again. Ronald Reagan was in the White House and a series of brutes in Moscow let everyone, and one of whom was the head of the KGB, let everyone to believe worst possible scenarios. 1992, however, this period of 19, early 1990s, there is reason to believe to be positive that things might work out. And we now need to speak of the personality and the success or not of the governor, Chris Patton. What do we need to know about Chris Patton and his role in this transformation, Mark? Yeah, um, he, I think he's a very important figure. He also came in mid-1992, coincidentally, um, a month after I did, um, and uh, was tasked with John Major, who had succeeded Margaret Thatcher, with um, trying to raise the bar for democracy and openness in Hong Kong. Major had been treated very badly on a visit um, to China. I, I think he's always found the Chinese very unhelpful uh, on Hong Kong, very suspicious, very grudging. And I think he just got fed up with it. I, I, it's sad that, you know, this hadn't happened 10 or 20 or, as I said, you know, 70 years earlier. But Chris Patton came when he came. And he immediately, uh, first thing he did uh, was the, the day after he arrived was to do a walkabout through a crowded market area of a uh, very working class part of Hong Kong. He was a retail politician and he had He'd uh, got the political bug working for John Lindsay when Lindsay was running for mayor of New York. And Patton brought that a complete breath of fresh air after the blimps and the colonial governors wearing hats with feathered plumes on them. Patton was like kind of ordinary guy who talked to people and eat egg tarts, a, a popular specialty in Hong Kong. But more than that, he tried to improve people's lives. Uh, you know, a lot of spending on sewage treatment. When he arrived, 90% of the sewage was just dumped into the harbor. Patton said, this is outrageous. And he coupled this kind of infrastructure, social welfare spending with more democracy. He dramatically increased the, the uh, electoral franchise. He appointed, he still had the right to appoint some people to the city council. He appointed young women, pro-democracy people completely flummoxed the Chinese because they've been used to dealing with the mandarins, the get along, go along, panda huggers in, in Britain's uh, foreign and colonial The, the, the blimps, the, the, the Chinese communists were satisfied with the blimps. They sat together and enjoyed themselves. They loved the blimps because they were men after their own heart. And Patton wasn't. They couldn't control him. They couldn't, they couldn't, ha they didn't have anything on him. He was a guy who was transparent, who believed in openness, who believed in democracy. And one other very important thing, he constantly told the Hong Kong people how great they are. They were. He helped them understand how special Hong Kong was. He helped end the colonial cringe. And that was as important as all of his democratic reforms, all of his spending. He got Hong Kongers to believe in themselves. The detail I want to emphasize, did he walk through Sham Shui Po? The, the Sham Shui Po, yeah, he did, yeah. A detail here, Hong Kong is not at this time glistening towers. It has a large working class that's to be generous, poor section, and the housing is totally inadequate. Mark has mentioned that hygiene is a mixed story. I don't believe the wonderful subway trains. My son visited Hong Kong and he was a young person. He was dazzled by it, Mark. This is in the 21st century. So what we have here is not one great big group of middle-class people reading the New York Times. 
We have all parts of the mainland represented, all speaking Cantonese. And there are very few tourists or people coming from the mainland at this time. Is that correct in the early uh, 90s? Absolutely correct. A couple thousand a year. It was 50 million by 2018. But at that point, you didn't hear Mandarin on the streets. It was you know, a lot of six story walk ups. People lived in caged homes, subdivided flats. If you had, some, I've been even recent in the last few years, could be 100, 125 square feet and you'd have five people, a family of five in there. I mean, these were tough conditions. For a guy like Patton to come out, I mean, people mobbed him. I mean, they thrust babies at him. I mean, it's just unbe unbelievable the adulation that people had for Patton and continued to have. Uh, I don't believe he can visit Hong Kong anymore. I don't think he'd be safe, but... Um, uh, you know, I've, on recent visits, you know, I've been, been with him on some of them. The, the popular uh, support for him was unbelievable. And there never been anybody before or since like that. I mean, the guys that, that uh, succeeded him, the, the Chinese uh, chief executives, uh, are afraid to walk out in the street. Did he want to do a Singapore? Was that in the wind Possible? No, no. It, by that point, it was just too late. I mean, he was trying to make the best of a bad deal. Uh, I think if there were ever going to be a Singapore moment, it would have been in the late 40s, early, early 50s, when China was still weak. And it would have taken actually a lot more of a push from the U.S., I, I think, than it, than it had. And by the way, Zhou Enlai, who was the premier, the numbered, longtime number two to Mao Zedong, reached out with specific warnings to the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan in the mid-1950s, uh, telling Hong Kong not to go, telling the British not to allow Hong Kong to go down that, that conspiracy, route. Conspiracy, 1958. Uh, is, is there a word in Mandarin that everybody loves that means conspiracy, or do they have a lot of different characters? I mean, they seem to love this word. Well, they, they don't believe that anything is true. They believe there has to be another, another uh, there has to be some kind of hidden plot. And they, they believe there was a hidden plot led by the Americans uh, for Dominion status. I've never seen any evidence of it. It does, doesn't mean it didn't exist. Uh, and by the way, Eisenhower did secretly pledge to um, defend Hong Kong, perhaps even new, using nuclear weapons if it were invaded by the Chinese. So, you know, look, the U.S. was, was very involved, but I've never seen any, any push towards independence. John Major comes in the 97 handover. And the quote I have, and it's probably much longer, our former colony was in sparkling shape. What is this? He only sees the good parts of the world? What is he talking about? It was, uh, I think a lot of people, well, the Chinese thought that the British were deliberately going to, to sabotage the economy. They were going to take all the money and the reserves and everything good and, and trash the place. And in fact, uh, economically, with the stock market, property prices, economic growth, low unemployment, um, Hong Kong was in, was in great shape. It's not to say it didn't have a lot of problems. But as Major himself has written in his memoirs, he had to put a positive gloss on things. You know, as a prime minister, you can't say, actually, we're really worried that these thugs from up, up north are going to wreck things. I mean, that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So John Major was a little bit of a, of a kind of um, Sonny John sort of personality when it came to this. With the handover takes place, and now we come to the Asian contagion. There was a recession worldwide in 1998 that started in America, but spread quickly and it damaged everybody's prospects. However, the war that starts in 2001 uh, is a moment for um, Hong Kong to be, participate in the worldwide banking uh, uh, growth. And we have lots of money flowing into the mainland through Taiwan, through Hong Kong, through Singapore. And there's reason to believe that things are going to get better and better and better. And then, When's the first bump in the 21st century? What what date would you say foreshadowed where we are today, Mark? Well, economically, I think, you know, a signal moment was with the global financial crisis in, in 2008. And China got out of that by printing money and came out of it really, really strong. Um, but I'd also say you mentioned 2001 in the war, but it was also um, and the obviously attacks, uh, the 9-11 attacks, just three months after the 9-11 attacks in December uh, China entered the World Trade Organization, which it had been trying to do for a, a decade or so. And um, many of us felt that this would put a lot of stress on China. And uh, I, in fact, wrote a book with the incoming director general of the WTO. We were more optimistic, but we thought it was going to push 
reforms within China along. And it did push many reforms. In fact, it was so successful that China became an economic juggernaut of a sort that the world has never seen in terms of the speed of its growth and the, the growth of its, its export sector and its manufacturing sector. And so this combination of China entering the WTO in 2001, which really accelerated what was already rapid growth, uh, combined with uh, the I guess, feebleness of the, the response in the West after 2000, the 2008 crisis put China on a whole different tra trajectory and gave it a sense that it could do whatever it wanted in the world. And when Xi Jinping came in uh, 10 years ago in 2012, he really pushed that agenda to establish China as the top dog, pushed that agenda along. You were watching the Tibetan horrors in 2008, prior to and subsequent to the Olympics. The self-immolations, the brutality, the stationing of Chinese soldiers and fire companies throughout the large cities of Tibet. Did people in Hong Kong think that's our future or was that another world? No, it was another world. I think, and this is you know, sort of the sad thing about Hong Kong having its own identity. It's always been felt that it was kind of apart from the mainland. So wasn't too worried about Tibet, wasn't too worried about... Um, the Uyghurs. In fact, Hong Kong became more insular. So this young generation of activists, the the post, uh, well, this was more like 2014, but a lot of them stopped commemorating June 4th because they're like, eh, democracy in China, what does that have to do with us? Mainland China, it's not our struggle. You know, we're about Hong Kong. And so sadly, and it's only now actually that you have this very large and growing Hong Kong diaspora that the Hong Kongers, the Uyghurs, and the Tibetans and mainland activists are trying to act more in concert. Unfortunately, people are now outside of Hong Kong, uh, outside Let, of China. Let's go to 2019 and the end. Mark Clifford, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, a very detailed telling of why Hong Kong struggled all these decades to be unique, to be a success, a postmodern city, it called itself, with culture, with depth, with education, lots of education. Mark makes the point, it's really nerdy and it's really geeky. They study everything, including how to fire, throw a, a Molotov cocktail. We come to 2019, five demands. What are they, Mark? I have extradition. They want the extradition bill stopped. You can't kidnap us. They want police brutality punished. They want amnesty for those who've been arrested. Uh, but chiefly, they want full universal suffrage. Did they know that was provocative? Did they know that the fire would come? They knew it was provocative. I don't think anyone imagined how quickly and how, how uh, severely the Chinese would crack down uh, on the demands. But by 2019, things had reached a boiling point. And it had been 22 years since uh, Hong Kong had been given back to the mainland. That's 22 years out of 50 years that Hong Kong was promised this high degree of autonomy, promised more freedom than ever, promised Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, promised that they'd be able to vote for their mayor and their city council, and nothing was happening. Beijing just kept moving the goalposts back, moving the goalposts back, and people were fed up with it. And this new generation of activists, people like Joshua Wong, born in 1996, a whole slew of young people born in the 90s, mid to late 90s, they had no memory of Chris Patton and the evil British oppressors, as the Chinese like to uh, say, uh, but they wanted the freedom that went with a kind of international, global, postmodern, well-educated, affluent city that Hong Kong was. I mean, they weren't asking for the world. They were just asking what was promised to them. And they went out uh, and then the, the flashpoint came when the then mayor, chief executive, Carrie Lam, proposed a bill that would have allowed people arrested in Hong Kong to be sent back to the mainland for trial. This is uh, this is was just unthinkable, outrageous, because Hong Kong still did have its own legal system. And I think everybody, including a lot of the business community, very quietly worried, hey, what if uh, I get in a business dispute with my partner in, in Wuhan or Shanghai or Beijing and they use their political connections to go to a judge and get an arrest warrant for me in Hong Kong? I mean, maybe I've never done anything wrong, but I'm not going to get justice in the mainland. I, I'm effectively being kidnapped. I could be looking at torture, life imprisonment, death in prison. And the whole city just rose up. And uh, the, there were large protests uh, against the bill, and, and it, was, it was stopped. But in the course of that, the police brutality really ratcheted up. And so these five demands came 
uh, as a result of the police brutality. They wanted, as you say, a real, they wanted universal suffrage. They wanted an end to that bill. They also wanted a designation. They were called rioters, which has quite severe legal penalties. They wanted that drop. They wanted a a real, um, a real uh, investigation into the police. Unfortunately, they didn't get any of that. But over the period of the next roughly six months, the the uh, level of um, violence unfortunately increased. But public support stayed very, very strong for the pro democracy movement. At the end of this tumultuous period, uh, there was an election for. Um, district council office is very low level, the lowest in, in Hong Kong, ward level office. And the turnout was extraordinary, well over 70 percent, highest in Hong Kong history, very high by global standards. And the pro-democracy people ran home with a landslide. And I think at that point, Beijing said, wow, we have lost this city, but we're not going to accept it. We're not going to accept the results at the ballot box. We're just going to throw people in jail. The national security law follows. No reason to follow that. Everybody knows what villainy is. Mark has lessons for all of us as to how China, uh, Beijing did this, how the CCP did this. Well, uh, I they're, think, they're, go ahead, Mark. No, I think one important thing is that unlike in Be Beijing, they didn't kill in, in 1989, they didn't kill hundreds of people, but they used a legal system. They used media, law, administration, and willing... Um, Enablers, Quislings, local officials, business people, and others who were who were too afraid to um, to um, oppose them, and so it shows you know the fragility of institutions even in a place like uh, Hong Kong. But I think you, we can go on and talk about what the lessons are for the, the rest of the economic world. economic weapons, the uh, forcing people to choose sides. You can't remain in between, and using technology, the surveillance technology. What strikes me, Mark, is as I was making that list, writing it down, I thought Pakistan, I thought Argentina, I thought Sri Lanka, same tools, uh, and using them on the elite who are then isolated and compromised and can't get out. And it works, Mark, it worked. Did, Beijing, did Hong Kong see it happening at the time, that the investments, the tourism, and the surveillance technology was going to be used against it? Oh, I think many people were worried, were worried and, um, uh, but there wasn't really a lot they could do until it was too late. And then when the national security law came in um, in the middle of 2020, there was about a five-week five uh, notice period, but uh, even the elite were completely caught off guard. This was done in Beijing. It was completely against every promise that Beijing had made. Uh, no consultation with Hong Kong. Even the chief executive didn't see the law until the morning that it was uh, the day it was promulgated. Uh, but I, I think there are larger lessons for the rest of the world, even places that, that are not, you know, under the thumb of, of China in the way that Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and of course, Hong Kong are. And that's that China is increasingly trying to um, define what, what media and politicians around the world can do. So as part of my uh, current job, I'm, I run a group called Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. We have one minute. Go ahead. And uh, what uh, we're finding as we meet politicians from around the world is they're being threatened by Chinese diplomats, Chinese media people, netizens. You can't do that. You can't go to Taiwan. You can't say this about Tibet. You can't support the Uyghurs. You can't support Hong Kong. China wants to take these bully tactics worldwide. And I think we have to be alert. We have to stand up and we have to call them out, whether they're physically harassing people, as they've done to many, many Hong Kongers in the diaspora, or whether they're, they're threatening um, you know, elected politicians, media people, and others. I think eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. The book is Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. Mark Clifford is the author. I'm John Batchelor.